We're back. Can you believe it? We're back. And we're going to talk more about that wonderful subject, visibility of your network, in your network. If you can't see it, you can't fix it. We got some experts with us today, and we got Denny, the master of ceremonies. Denny, take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Uh, today, I, I, today is going to be a very dangerous show because we actually got two people mixed together that we normally try to separate them. <laughs> and so we have we have two special guests with us today. We have uh, 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 Keith Bromley, um, who uh, has been on the show for a number of times now, uh, building up a um, uh, a series of shows on visibility. And in addition, we invited uh, Mike uh, Kenny from Viavi Te uh, Solutions. And the reason we did that, um, I believe, is that um, uh, last show in the last show we talked about their entire uh, network visibility layer. Um, essentially using the analogy of like the the, um, the fire hose on one end, which is the network, uh, blasting out data, and then the consumer on the other end, then the end that wants to have a customized view of the network. And then in between is is uh, is two pieces. One is the, the network broker, uh, NPR, um, MP, uh, network packet broker, MPB uh, layer. And then and then right next to that is the, is the two layer. And so uh, with that in mind, we we invited uh, two of our best friends and, and two experts in the field. And if I if I understand it right, Keith, you represent the the plumbing side, right? Yeah. So basically, the network packet brokers taps getting the access to the data, like you talked about, and then the filtering and segmenting of that data that would feed into tools, mm -hmm. security monitoring tools, I should mm -hmm, say. Mm -hmm. And and Mike, you you represent kind of the. Uh, between um, the, the the kind of the managed uh, packet, if you will, and then essentially the, the useful information to the user. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So we're the, uh, I guess in that same analogy, we're the consumer of the data being fed from uh, from Key's product. Yeah. Now we don't want to make make the assumptions that everybody out there knows what we're talking about because <laughs> that's a dangerous assumption. So so I really I think we you know one of them just kind of dive right in and I, I think it helps everyone to to just kind of um, um, you know like have just a very simple descriptions of these different pieces are. And you know the old the old joke about the 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 two Hollywood stars sitting in a bar talking about themselves, and then all of a sudden they realize that they spend too much time talking to themselves, so they turn to each other and says, "Why don't you talk about me for a change?" <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if I could play a game. I wonder if I could get Mike to talk about sort of the um, the uh, the the bro uh, packet broker layer, you know, like have Mike talk about what Key is providing, and then turns around and, and talks about what Key have Key talk about what he needs to provide to Mike. Would that work? Yeah, that sounds kind of cool. I, I, yeah, I think I think that would be good. I think I think you know for all, all that is for the benefit of the end user, which we all serve together, right? Okay, so so Mike, you go ahead. Uh, you go first. So so we know we know the fire hydrant. We got a lot of data coming from the network, and you're on the other side trying to get a a, a better view of that network. Um, and and so talk about what uh, what Keith has to offer. Yeah, absolutely. So just as you said, Danny, we we have to digest that fire hose. And there, there's certain factors in, in any device that ingests data, right? You've got limitations on data rate. You've got limitations on uh, valuable disk for back in time forensics, right? So, you know, if a problem happened uh, last Thursday at three o'clock in the afternoon, being able to go back in time to be able to, to grab that user's data, that user's fin fingerprints, which are the packets. Um, and, and the same goes for security forensics, right? To be able to go back in time. So there needs to be something that can prune that data in a logical, uh, a logical sense, right? So we talk a lot about filtering the data, uh, forwarding specific streams to uh, our appliance. And, and so for example, uh, I, I probably don't care about uh, the backup that runs three o'clock at three o'clock in the morning, right? So being able to intercept that traffic before it hits the analyzer saves on valuable resources on disk, valuable resources on on uh, the NIC and its ability to write to disk. Um, one of the, one of the biggest things that that I, I see from a specifically from the from Keys product that. Uh, that I'm, I'm really excited about. It really has me jazzed up is, you know, I've been doing uh, designing and building uh, these visibility architectures for a number of years. I've used pretty much every product that's, that's come out. Um, one of the beautiful things in, about uh, 
the, uh, the I believe it's a Vision One product that's uh, just recently announced or hasn't been out for very long, right? Am I right, Keith? Is that uh, actually it's been out for a year now? So oh, okay. Yep. Well, I apologize. Uh, it's new to me. Yep. Uh, I've been on the packet side uh, for quite a while, but the beautiful thing about that product is, you know, historically, if we wanted to capture that sensitive data, right? Uh, usually we want to get everything decrypted so that we can analyze it from an application performance perspective. I want to see the entire get, for example, or the entire HTTP header. Um, but there's been a lot of security concerns, obviously with, with PCI and HIPAA and, and some of the other regulations where if there is sensitive data, such as bank account numbers, credit card numbers, social security numbers, uh, we've been forced to basically slice those packets, right? To uh, shave off the payload, which is invaluable for troubleshooting application performance problems, right? We need to go above TCP in a lot of cases to understand what's happening with the application. And one of the features that I, that I love about the Ixia product is, is uh, being able to do data masking, right? So you can actually go and, and via regex expressions, uh, mask out sensitive information, replace it with X's uh, and uh, forego the need to, to slice those packets. So, you know, and again, I'm, I, I may be going on a little bit longer than you expected, Denny, but, uh, you know, I, I've run into, a, a, with my role at Viavian as a consultant, I, I go into literally hundreds of customer sites uh, per year and look at different architectures and, and hear different stories of, you know, on it. Again, one of the things I'm hearing constantly is this false uh, sense of security from network engineers thinking that, hey, we're going to SDN or we're going to a, a Cisco ACI architecture. That means we don't need packet brokers, right? And, and you couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, that the implementation of SDN or an SDN type network drives up the need for a visibility architecture more than it does decrease it, right? So. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you, Mike. So, so Keith, um, I, I used to be, I used to be where you are, right? My, my last company, we were, yes. were in the, in the network broker uh, business, although that was well before the name was adopted. Um, so, so our, our two, our friends at the two side, you know, people like Mike, they are our best friend. Right? Exactly. They're, they're what drives the demand for our product. So, um, so, so it's your turn to talk about um, what, 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 are, what is the expectation uh, on, on you then from, from my side? Well, so, I mean, it, it all starts with getting the proper access, right? So you want to tap that the gives you all this data, but it's, it's like we said in the last uh, podcast we had, it's like drinking from a fire hydrant. You get all this data coming at the tool and that's where Viavi and these other vendors are. They're the tools that uh, go and analyze the data. You know, that's, that's where the rubber hits the road. You've got this data, you want to inspect it, you want to do something with it, but you can't handle this massive flood coming at you. So a packet broker, like the one that uh, Ixia makes, and of course we make taps too, but the packet broker that we're talking about here can actually go in and filter and segment that data and make the tools like uh, Viavi's uh, network uh, performance monitoring and their security tools and even some of the other vendors out there, we can make those tools much more efficient because we get rid of all the extraneous stuff you don't need. Yeah, there, there's all this data coming, but is it of interest? Well, probably most of it isn't for this specific instance, whatever you're looking at. If you're using a DLP or something to to uh, mine data for uh, you know security forensics to look at uh, threats and see where uh, threats may be hidden and, and so forth. If you want to optimize your network with performance information and see how it's performing, well, Maybe you need a little bit more there, but still, you don't want the whole set of data coming at you. So we go in, we filter that data, we deliver uh, just what the tool needs, and we can be very specific and granular on uh, the feeds we give to the different tools. So like Viavi with their security uh, set of, of uh, components and their network monitoring or performance monitoring, I should say. We can have we can actually feed the different sets of tools give with the one packet broker and do different feeds going to different tool sets that they offer to go in and perform the functions they need. And Mike mentioned uh, data masking. That's just one of the things we can do deduplication. We can filter on application type. We can filter on uh, IP address, VLANs, do all this different filtering and really segment that data for them. 
Mm-hmm. Thank you, Keith. Hey, um, so we're gonna we have a list of things that we want to talk about, uh, the key points to that that we want to do and some action items. But before I before we do that, we're gonna dive into the details in a minute. But before we do that, hey Tim, why don't you play the role of the end user? You're the corporate guy, and and you got a network. You got to take a look at it. Um, what's the success criteria for this visibility layer? What what does it have to do? Well, you got to have access to everything because. And you have to have it in relative time. Uh, you got to be able to see what's going on, when it's going on, uh, because then the filtering really begins to be the main uh, capability of allowing to see things. Uh, so, you know, first off, playing the role of most corporate uh, COs, or CIOs, CSOs. Uh, my first comment is, the network did what? How did it? Well, how? Huh? How did we? I I don't understand this. And then the finger pointing begins. Is it application server network, you know, WAN, whatever. So uh, we're seeing more and more litigation now in corporate boards because corporate boards have not necessarily in the past taken a very big interest in it. But now that when you're talking about, you know, two or three million dollars a minute sometimes of lost data, not to mention loss of reputation, uh, I know for a fact because I have a company that's been breached many times and I no longer bank with them and I no longer uh, have credit cards with them or anything. And I have, you know, they lost some one, one bank lost somewhere close to two and a half million uh, customers around the world because of multiple breach and the laissez-faire attitude they had. So uh, if I was a corporate manager, I would want to have a monthly report on what's normal and then uh, and Mike and I would call these baselines. Uh, but then I, I need that depository of, of what happened and be able to go back and filter that and present the right data to the right tools. Because you can't, n- not many people, I mean, there are a couple of companies that claim they can do 100 gigabits, uh, which I don't believe for a minute. And even if they can capture and visualize it, the person on the end, other end, his eyes will go funny and he'll faint. So you've got to have that repository. You've got to have all the data, and you've got to have the different tools to monitor, like Mike said, compliance, okay, uh, data leaks, server uh, efficiency, applications. I mean, with an average of uh, several different uh, studies have shown that well over 90% of web applications are hacked or can be easily hacked. That's scary. And if you're running a business, you got your e-commerce site running and it's getting redirected or copied, we call it, you know, copy playing, where every time someone puts in a credit card number, four other sites get it that are not good sites, and you don't know that, you're culpable. It's your responsibility. Yeah. If, if you're the CIO of your company, what they're hacking is not your network. They're hacking your career. Your, <laughs> I mean, this is, we're this seeing is a more career, and more of that, this is a career yeah. ending move, right? Yeah. yeah, we're seeing more and more of that, Denny. Uh, more and more people are being held accountable in such a way where it uh, it's costing them their jobs. No, it's absolutely, absolutely. There's a, I mean, work gets around. <laughs> it's not, no one's going to be happy. Hey, um, so, uh, sorry, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, no, I, I, I yeah, I, I agree more so on the, the career ending thing, right? Because it's your reputation at the end of the day. And uh, I don't think there's too many CSOs that uh, survive a, a major hack that are uh, getting recruited. Yeah. I mean, right? it's, people neither forget nor forgive. Mm-hmm. It's just, yeah, it's just the reality we live in. Yeah, it, uh, it's, uh, okay, so... Um, so, so keep you put together a very uh, comprehensive list of uh, bullets, things that we can talk about today. So why don't you pick one or two and, and, and start with that? Okay, well, actually, uh, so I wanted to set the stage first. So like I said, I mean, we're here to talk about what can you really do with the visibility architecture now that we've talked about what it is. Well, so there's like seven basic areas or use case categories, whatever you want to call it. So one is improved network reliability. Another one is strengthened network security. Third is control cost. There's speed up troubleshooting, optimizing network performance, strengthening regulatory compliance, and reducing unexpected issues or blind spots. Those are like the seven fundamental areas. 
And so we already talked about some of those, especially with like Tim's case there, where he was talking about uh, network security. There, all regulatory compliance is always another big one as well. And and then I think Tim also brought up the network reliability. You know, a few minutes of downtime that can really cost you a lot of money. So those are the general categories. But if you go through and you look under them, that's where you know Ixia and Viavi and and we have all these different type of capabilities we can help out with. So like I sort of mentioned it before, one was um, packet filtering and deduplication. They can help reduce the load on monitoring tools. We can basically get rid of extraneous information so that the tools that you've got are much more efficient. But then also when you've got the tools like the uh, network performance monitoring, application performance monitoring and so forth, those are really there to help you improve your quality of service, your quality of experience for customers you know, and help you optimize your SLA performance. So that's where like Viavi comes in and they can really help you optimize the network. It, it It's not about just having it. It's not about, hey, I've got it. I put it out there. It's running. Nobody's complained. Well, you may be one day away from having some sort of uh, massive failure or maybe even you just have applications slowing down. It's still running, but it slows down. That still causes you performance issues, still could, you know, from a um, network engineering level, could come back at you on your key performance indicators where you've got so much, um, um, or, or you've got KPIs, I should say, around uptime, but also about uh, network performance and speed and processing and uh, transactions and so forth. So those are a couple. Um, there's also inline and out-of-band data filtering for the security tools. So, you know, again, it's about getting the right information to the security tools. One of the cool use cases is to do like serial data chaining. So data comes in, and this would be like an inline case, com comes into a bypass switch, gets routed up to a network packet broker. That packet broker could then, based upon um, protocols, VLANs, whatever you set up, can route data over to a de decryption device. It can then take data back from the decryption device, route it over to an I IPS. Maybe the IPS is connected to a SIM and uh, the IPS identifies that there's some um, suspect data here. The SIM can direct the NPB then to forward data over to another security tool for further analysis. But you can go through and essentially automate and increase the um, the number of um, uh, alerts that you get that, that you can actually go in and, and inspect. There's um, you know all sorts of studies out there that talk about these tools they come up with, whatever, you know. Um, I'll just pick a number, say 5,000 alerts a day or something. But typically, uh, you can only inspect, usually it's done manually, but you can only inspect like less than 30% of those. Well, what happens to the other 70%? They, they, they're not inspected. You don't know what what's in that data, what went through your network, if you didn't stop the data flow, it, is there some potential malware lurking? Is there some sort of, of security threat in there you don't know about? You can use uh, this use case I just mentioned to go through and help you increase that inspection rate. Okay, well, let's stop for a minute. That, yep, that, might, exactly. that might respond to that uh, or augment to that. Yeah, yeah so, you know, Keith, Keith had mentioned a lot of different a lot of different things in, in that statement, right? You mentioned APM, NPM, security, SIMs, intrusion detection systems. And that's the beautiful thing about a packet broker, right? To have this architecture where uh, most of the companies that I'm working with today are, you know, calling that uh, a shared visibility network, right? So it's, it, it's not just the network engineering team that owns this architecture anymore. It, it spans across application security groups, network teams, and what's beautiful about that is that, you know, that with the combined uh, support of those different facets within your IT organization, you can also pull budgetary dollars from those different groups as well to build out the complete visibility that you really need and that all these tools are looking at packets as the, the single source of truth, right? Because we know they are. Uh, you know, the, the famous saying is that packets don't lie. Um, being able to share those amongst tools and share that budgetary cost amongst different departments is, is huge. And, and, and one thing I guess I'll add too, and, and I'll uh, ask Tim for his, some of his comments on it, but I know we've talked about on some of the other uh, webcasts and podcasts that we've done, uh, security related, right? I mean, we look at what's the average statistic today, Tim, 44 days before people realize they've been hacked. Has it gone so up to two, 
It's about 266 days, actually. 260. Yeah, wow. That's So <laughs> what we're doing is not working, right? I think we can admit that, that the, the current uh, status quo of, of pseudo visibility isn't working anymore. Uh, these visibility fabrics are not a nice to have. They're, they're a must have. Well, not only are the fabric, but you have to have people that do something with them, understand it. They need oh, to have it. the yeah. criteria. You know, your job is not to run around and worry about an end user has got a problem with Windows. Your job <laughs> is security. Your job is visibility. It's scary. And remember, a lot of these statistics come from people that actually report what mm -hmm. happened. The U.S. The Department of Commerce estimates that that's only roughly 40% of the people that are actually breached. And, uh, and uh, excuse me, 40% of those that know they've been breached. Okay? I mean, you think about it. When we talk, we talk about the Fortune 1000 companies around the world. Okay? Think of all the companies that are the Fortune not 5000. Mm -hmm. They don't even know, you know, what's going on. Had a friend of mine call me up not too long ago. I think I told him to keep this one and since I think someone's gotten in my network, what do I do? I said, well, do you know how to, you know, dig into it and look? He says, no. And I said, unplug it from the network. <laughs> he, says, yeah. he says, that'll stop everything. I said, exactly. And your breach. <laughs> and then that'll give you time to try to figure out what broke or where it's broke. Okay. Um, and it, it, it is becoming a major issue of, Forbes just a week or two ago came out and said that there were roughly domestically in the United States openings for over a million security network security professionals. That's just network. That doesn't mean, you know, all the other aspects of forensics and cybersecurity, you know, cell phones, notebooks, tablets, all the end user kind of criteria. We're talking about just in the network world. And I think that is actually an understatement. I think there's, and you know, and again, we run into that problem. I'm, I have 50 people on my company. I can't afford a $250,000 a year guru. I can't recruit one. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, and then, and then like you guys were just talking about, part of it's, it's having the personnel, but part of it is just how you organize your architecture, how you go in and, and look at the visibility, tie it into your security architecture. They're not silos. Tie it into your network performance monitoring and your troubleshooting uh, capabilities. Tie it all together, get the visibility, put the use cases we've been talking about together where you can go in there and actually improve your, your performance and your processes across security and network monitoring. They're, they're all tied together in my opinion, even though a lot of people want to silo it because it's more convenient. I'm a security architect, I'm a network architect, but it, 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 it's, you gotta, you gotta do something different. I think like Mike said earlier, you gotta tie them together to get, to actually see what's going on, see what you're missing. Yeah. And I, I, most of, most of the time when Mike and I go into meetings, what's the first thing we run into? Finger pointing. Yeah. Well, it's not my yeah. world. It's your world. Oh, uh, no, it's not my world. It's your world. And then, and that's so unproductive. And like you said, if you build a good visibility infrastructure, you can eliminate that mm -hmm. finger pointing before it ever starts. You know? And then, you, to me, you can also actually eliminate some of the people involved, which, you know, sometimes the... The higher up say, well, no, we want to be involved. And it's like, okay, yeah, but it, sometimes I'd rather you not. So, like, when you put a packet broker in there and you connect it up to the tap, a lot of the activity, and you connect the tools up to the network packet broker, a lot of the change board approvals and getting some of the senior management involved is no longer needed. You've already got access to the network. You're not touching the network really anymore. You're not changing it. You can go ahead and start capturing data, start analyzing data, and not have to do, to wait on delays from old, outdated processes. Right. I love it. Concur. And this is yeah. one thing I do want to say. I think Mike and I have talked about this, and I know Keith and I have. If you get a device like a deduplication monitoring tool, make sure you don't have duplicate packets before you deploy it. And if you're using a span port, you're most likely getting it from your span port, okay? So that's where dedupe becomes very powerful. But first off, make sure you don't have duplicate path or multiple route path. That can cause you a lot of heartaches while you're sitting there filtering all that out, thinking everything is wonderful, 
But in the meantime, you're crashing the application every few minutes because duplicate paths. So always make sure you eliminate that before you eliminate that. Yeah, that's a that's a great point, Tim. And it's uh, just from a little tips and tricks perspective, very easy to take a very short packet capture, pull it into Wireshark or pick your favorite analyzer and determine if this is a real retransmission or if it's a duplicate packet just by simply looking at the TCP header, the IP identifier, the timestamp on the inner delta or inner frame delta. So yeah, there's a, that, that's, a, that's a great tip, Tim, of, of before you turn on dedupe, uh, grab a five second capture and just look at the packets. But one of the other things I kind of wanted to add to, to what Keith was saying is that I can't tell you the number of times I've gone in to quote unquote troubleshoot a network problem, right? Where we've, we've placed the analyzer uh, in the core of the data center, started capturing all this traffic and, and just notice, hey, you know, one, one that I, I talk about specifically was uh, a large retailer in the Midwest where we went in and and uh, saw all kinds of email traffic. I mean, terabytes of email traffic. And uh, I pointed that out to the to the engineer and said, "Well, why is there so much email coming from this server? Uh, you know, it was all outbound." And, and he's like, "Oh, that's not an email server." So, <laughs> again, kind of along the the the, the Tim O'Neill school of security analysis, unplug the thing, right? Shut down the switch port. Let's figure out what's going on. Because there's 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 no reason that a, a file server in your network should be uh, tunneling off in this case uh, uh, terabytes of, of traffic over uh, the pop port. <laughs> yep, and it happens a lot. By the yeah, way. That, that's not something that's a oh, it happens a lot. Well, and that and that kind of goes into you know we're 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 looking at a an APM NPM tool uh, that that found a security problem. Right. I mean, and, and it goes back to that that thing you're talking about earlier, Tim, about understanding what's normal on your network. What are your traffic patterns? What what applications are normal? What's your uh, you know, what's your whitelisted IP addresses? I mean, there's a lot of really simple things from, a, you know, it doesn't take a, a Ph.D. physicist to, to do these things. I mean, it's very readily available for uh, the average network engineer. Yeah, I mean, people all the time uh, ask questions like, well, what should I look for? One of the students asked that question when they were in this recent uh, Southeastern uh, Collegiate Cybersecurity Competition. And I said, just turn your analyzer on your Wireshark and look for ACNAX or SYNCAX or SYNCNAX. Just get, a, just get a feel for what's going on. If you're getting a lot of SYNCNAX coming, coming from the network, then you may have somebody in here that's already rooted and they're trying to contact a malicious server. If you're seeing a bunch of sync NACs in your network, then you got application problems, okay? So just grab a few little things, but that's what's so cool about the packet brokers. I could have five wire sharks running, or T sharks, or snorts, or you know, any kind of, even a simple reconnaissance tool, okay, like Nmap. I could have that running, and at the same time, I could be running Wireshark looking for VoIP packets, my RTP, my RTSP flows. Uh, just so when my boss yells at me, the conference, video conference is, you know, got a problem. No, you don't. You know, it's fine. The network is fine. Of course, if you look at that through a span port, you'll think it's fine no matter what. <laughs> That's why people like span port, Tim. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It makes things look good. Yeah, it tells you what you want to hear. <laughs> hey, uh, we should we should try to wrap the show. I'll wrap up the show because I, I uh, uh, the the our experience is that if we keep it around thirty minutes, um, we get more audience. Um, so why don't we uh, spend a, just a little bit of time on call to actions, um, specifically about uh, resources that are available on the two uh, respective uh, companies. So you go first, Keith. Yeah, so we've actually got a lot of resources available on ixiacom.com. That's I-X-I-A-C-O-M.com. If you go to the resources page, like one of them, there's a webinar called Six Ways Network Visibility Can Optimize Your Network. It really goes and it talks about uh, these uh, different categories I mentioned and 15 of the top use cases. There's also some white papers. There's a best practice for network monitoring, a deduplication best practice. 
and then there's uh, more information on a uh, out of band visibility uh, page and then also an inline visibility page as well so a mm -hmm. lot of cool stuff there mm -hmm, mm -hmm. mike yeah so uh, if you go to viavisolutions.com we have uh, all the information on our uh, products as far as uh, the gigastore uh, which are the capture devices we were talking about um, I, I gotta I gotta plug this because we recently uh, came out with a 40 gigabit per second wire speed uh, capture device uh, which we're really excited about but we also have a lot of white papers on uh, using packet capture for security as well as uh, the, the NPM APM type of uh, discussions on on how to use packets to, to troubleshoot application performance problems mm -hmm. thank you yeah, I know we have shark week coming up Mike yeah, what is that um, I'm not sure that it's this soon, Tim. We usually have that in the fall, so I'm, okay, <laughs> I thought it was I'm, coming up soon. Yeah, mm -hmm. unless I'm uh, unaware of some other. We we typically do quite a few uh, Wireshark related, packet capture related, security related webinars uh, on uh, VIBSolutions.com. So you can check those links for for details and archives on those as well. And if mm -hmm. I'm on my tool, we'll post that up on it when it starts too. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah absolutely. The, the, point, the point is that there's really a lot of information out there uh, in, in different companies' website because that's you know that's the business. And we do that on Love My Tool. There's a lot of uh, shot, Wireshark related uh, website. There's just a whole bunch of information out there for everyone to, to really um, uh, learn about this. I, 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 I hate to be blunt. I, I'm telling you, you know, if you're the CSO of your company and you get hacked, and because you didn't do the things you're supposed to do, and um, the network will eventually recover, your career will not. <laughs> and, and, and and if you don't recover from your career, it's not because you're ignorant, it's because you're lazy. Okay? Oh, I, I mean, I really hate to be blunt about this, but I mean, we're here to help you. Um, so with that, Tim, uh, you be the nice guy now. Me? Oh. <laughs> you know, listen, the, uh, uh, years ago when I was a young engineering student, back when Morse code was still being used, most people don't know what Morse code is, I, I was a, a professor of mine told me, he says, just remember, get good quality components, no matter what you build, and you'll always be successful, or you'll have a much more of a chance of being successful. If you're going to go out and buy packet brokers, deep capture, you know, whatever. Uh, and like Denny just said, if you're CO, CISO, whatever, VP of Morse code, uh, you know, seek out experts like Mike, you know, like Keith. Find these guys and ask them. Don't listen to a bunch of BS from some high-paid guy that comes in and he's got an MBA and he's going to tell you, how much you can say because he doesn't even understand what you're doing really so get experts run it by them it doesn't cost that much and it will save your career and more importantly it'll save a lot of people a lot of grief mm -hmm. you know because every time someone's breached it's uh, right now i think a uh, lifelock said uh, not too long ago that it was roughly about six months of work to regain your credit control of your credit um and that's with, you know, good companies like LifeLock helping you. It can be mitigated, but still, it takes a while. So don't go there. Help those people before you harm them. Go out and ask people like Mike. And go out to Viavi. Go out uh, to my favorite group, uh, the NTO group, uh, at the Invisibility Group at uh, Ixia. Uh, so take the time and learn about it before you deploy it. And I think you'll save a lot of money. And I will make one comment. Mike, you mentioned SDN earlier. SDN is not the second coming. As a matter of fact, it's the third burning. Uh, if you don't know what you're doing with SDN, uh, you're, you know, anytime you, you take the control plane away from the data plane, and that's what the fundamental of SDN is, it doesn't mean you can't, you don't need to look anymore. Because the problems are still there. As a matter of fact, they're going to be a little bit harder to find. So don't Agreed. get caught in all this hype crap, technology crap. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Uh, we're going to close the show by uh, giving our two esteemed guests a, a chance to kind of do their last shout out. Um, we're going to start with uh, Mike, who's who's the, the guy closest to the customer. 
Um, Mike, um, just quickly, what are what are the best practices uh, for network architecture? Uh, I mean, uh, visibility architecture and network visibility. Yeah, so it really boils down to understanding your traffic patterns, right? I mean, that's where you start is understanding where the data flow goes, and then that'll give you a good idea of where you need to capture, right? And as as we've mentioned here before, uh, you know, it's it it's kind of goes back to that same uh, saying of of the, the earlier days of uh, switch where you can, route where you have to. It, it's it, it's it's tap where you can, span where you have to, uh, especially in, in virtual environments and, and uh, uh, moving to the cloud, which is, that's probably a whole nother, uh, a couple of uh, webcasts to talk about that. But, you know, building the visibility architecture starts and ends with understanding where the traffic is so that you can get in front of it. And, uh, you know, I, I'm a big fan of capturing everything and then filtering out what you don't need and uh, there's there's nothing better than a, a packet broker to do that for you. Mm, thank you, Mike. And and Keith, what are the what are the the career enhancing and not career busting best practices? <laughs> yeah. So I think uh, everything Mike said was right on. I mean, you got to start with the data. Get good data first. Filter out what you don't need, and then send that data to your tools. That you know th that's where the rubber meets the road. Like I said earlier, that the tools are where the security and monitoring tools are where you are actually going to go and solve your problems. But you need to get the data and you need to parse it out. And you know you can use other features like data masking stuff or regulatory compliance. So you only send the right data to in um, tools and it's it's not sent all over the network and you don't have compromised uh, issues there with people seeing data they shouldn't do and so forth. And you can filter the right types of data, but get, get the data, filter it, and then use your tools and and figure out your problems that way. It, it's quick, simple, easy. Just follow that recipe, tie it all together. It, I'll leave it at that. I can OK. Back. All right. Thank you, Cave. We had such a great show. I was so excited, so happy to have both of you on, and, and Tim as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you added Tim there. Thanks. <laughs> OK, so with that, we're going to close the show. We'll see you soon. And uh, keep. We have one. We have at least one more, right? Yeah, we actually got a couple more coming up. The okay, next good. one is going to be more of a deep dive on network performance monitoring and, and application performance monitoring, and then another one was going to be on security, uh, inline and out of band security. Deployments. All right, all right, that's my job. I mentioned on on Love My Tool, Keith has like what eight articles or nine articles, and we got some coming up from Mike. So uh, you know, just yep. Google Keith at LoveMyTool.com and. But um, you'll see a bunch of great articles, and soon we'll have Mike on there. So, uh, but we have right. several experts on how to use Wireshark and all that, all that stuff. So feel free. And 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 by the way, we should also give a shout out to Tony and Paul, who did such a great job. Why why you and I were busy doing something else. <laughs> yeah. the, the last the last RMTV show was great. Yeah. Thanks, Tony. Paul Thanks, Paul. Okay, yeah, Paul Offered and his new technology is really cool and yeah. it's free. Yeah. So, okay, well, we should have him on together one of these days. All right, with that, we're going to close the show. We see you soon, and we're very happy to be here serving you, helping you with your um, uh, uh, network and your career. Bye bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you. God bless bye. all. Be Thank safe. You. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>